Welcome back. Chapter 17, same day. Grandfather and Maddie have um, gotten a wagon ride back to the coffee house. Philadelphia is devastated. They haven't been there in a couple of weeks, and so seeing it now was pretty devastating um, how much the city has changed for the worse. Um, so Grandfather and Maddie are just going to have to take care of themselves. September 24th. By the time we reached the coffee house, it was midday. An ugly yellow scrap from a ripped bodice was still tied to the handle of our front door, which was open. I jumped out of the wagon before it had stopped moving. I leapt up the steps and burst through the doorway. Grandfather, hurry! The front room was a jumble. Tables and chairs lay helter-skelter. The clock was missing from the mantel. The pewter candle holders were nowhere to be found. King George's birdcage lay on the floor in pieces as if smashed by a heavy boot. Grandfather hadn't seen the foul-mouthed parrot in days. Had he come, on, come home and then flown off again? The destruction in the kitchen was even greater. Broken pottery covered the floor. The doors to the pantry stood open and Eliza's crocks of preserves, the sugar cone, and her spice cabinet were missing. The coffee and tea canisters lay on their sides, empty. The dried meat, and beans, and onions that usually hung from the ceiling had vanished. Even the kitchen table was overturned. Something crunched behind me. I whirled around, but it was only Grandfather picking his way across the broken plates. What happened here? He said quietly. His eyes moved over the mess, but it did not look like he could make sense of it. I was just here a few days ago. I locked the door, Maddie, I'm sure. His voice was on the edge of trembling. I picked up pieces of broken glass. Don't fret, I said. Someone broke in the window. You locked the door, Grandfather. It's not your fault. Did they take anything from upstairs? My heart thudded against my stays. Before Grandfather could say another word, I had lifted my skirts and raced up the staircase. The second floor looked as I had left it, except that Mother was missing. The powerful stench of sickness still lingered. I opened the windows and shutters to bring in some fresh air, and then crossed the hall. My bed was still in Grandfather's chamber. I glanced in to make sure everything was in its place. The room still held his presence, his books on the nightstand with an old pipe, a painting of grandmother hung over his bed with a picture of the farm where he grew up beside it. Whoever destroyed the first floor hadn't bothered coming up here. I went downstairs to rejoin grandfather. The clothes press at the bottom of the stairs was untouched, the bed linens and tablecloths stacked in it as neatly as if mother had set them there a moment ago. I lingered in front of it. It was almost possible to forget everything if I just focused on the scent of lavender and clean cotton and the beeswax that made the wood glow. Grandfather was picking through the broken chairs in the front room trying to salvage something to sit on. I opened all the windows and propped open the doors. There wasn't a breath of air to be had. The room still held the faint smell of coffee and tobacco smoke, but dust coated the furniture and the floor. Spider webs hung in the corners of the room. It felt like I had been gone a lifetime. Have a seat, girl, Grandfather instructed. You're still weak. Only if you sit as well. I said, your face is as red as an overripe cherry. I did not mention how hard he was breathing. We moved two chairs to the door where the air was a mite cooler. He massaged his left arm. Old battle wound, he said, when he noticed my concern. This arm goes pins and needles from time to time. The heat doesn't help any, nor this commotion. He was still breathing hard but his eyes had lost that glazed look that they'd had in the kitchen. He needed a good night's sleep in his own bed, I decided. Right. When you were here a few days ago, 
Everything was in order and locked up tight. You thought that mother had gone to the Lettington's farm. And Eliza, he said. She would have asked Eliza to join her. Eliza wouldn't go with her. She has family here and would have wanted to help. You know Eliza would never run from trouble. He nodded his head. Well, whoever came here didn't go above stairs, I continued. Maybe they saw the fever rag and thought there was still an invalid in the house. Well, it didn't stop them from destroying everything they touched, he said. Was anything else stolen? Food. They took every scrap of food from the kitchen. Even the, I froze, the strong box. I fumbled with the tread of the hollow stair and then threw it to the side and lifted out the metal box. I opened the lid. It was all still there, pence and shillings. Thank heaven for that. That's their money. I opened, or I returned the box to its hiding place. Could be worse, I thought. The house is still standing. We're alive. Mother and Eliza must be somewhere, safe. I had to believe that. The fever would soon be over, and our lives could return to normal. I just had to stay clever and strong and find something to eat. A tear surprised me by rolling down my cheek. None of that, Maddie girl, I whispered to myself as I scrubbed the tear away. This is not the time to be childish. A familiar yowl came from the back door. Silas waited at the threshold, unwilling to risk his paws on the messy floor. I carried him into grandfather. Here's a friendly face, I said, as I held the cat close. He seems healthy enough, I scratched between his ears. Silas rubbed his face in my hair. Why didn't you scare those intruders away? They probably fed the beast a bite of ham, and he showed them the way to Eliza's goodies, said grandfather. He tried to lift his sword and scabbard to its place over the mantle, but the, his arms shook too badly. I set Silas down and took the sword from him. Let me help you, I said. I raised the sword up to its resting place. Thank you, my sweet, grandfather said. I don't know what's come over me. I know, I said firmly. We've just come through a battle, and you need time to recuperate. I wagged my finger at him like a commanding officer. Captain Cook, you must report to your bedroll immediately for an extended leave, sir. Fresh water will be fetched for you. He saluted me. Yes, ma'am, General Maddie. I listened with envy as his boots shuffled up the stairs and clumped into his chamber. I wanted to take a nap. Why couldn't someone else come clean up this mess, fetch the water? Silas looked at me skeptically. You're right, I sighed. If I don't do it, no one will. But first, I need something to eat. Even mother believed in a good meal before chores. Let's get grandfather some water and then see what we can salvage for supper. Silas followed me outside. Oh my gracious. The garden looked dead. Insects had devoured most of the leaves and the vegetables, leaving behind skeletons of stems and branches. Weeds had exploded between the neat rows. All those weeks of back-breaking work had been for nothing. Hot tears threatened, but my grumbling stomach was more painful. I drew a bucket of water from the well and used the dipper to drink as much as I could hold. I spilled the dipper over my top of my head, shivering as the cold water trickled down my back. I carried the bucket inside and poured a mug for Grandfather. He was already asleep by the time I entered his room. His color seemed better, and he was snoring like a barn full of plow horses. I set the mug on the floor and tiptoed back downstairs. The ground was baked too hard to use the hoe. I decided to pull up what I could and hope to find something edible overlooked by the varmints. A cloud of bugs swarmed around my face every time I touched a withered plant. 
I weeded the bean patch and found a few hidden string beans for my efforts. The cabbage plants were so infested with worms, I couldn't even bring myself to look at them. Every few minutes, I crawled under the cherry tree for shade and another cool drink of water. Ants covered the cherries that lay on the ground, but I found enough on the tree to settle my stomach. Silas climbed up to a cozy nook between two branches and went to sleep. I'll not forget all your help, wretched cat, I muttered as I knelt in the squash patch. An hour later, I examined my treasure on the kitchen table. Two handfuls of green beans, four stunted crookneck squash that had been nibbled by mice, and a few sour cherries. I divided the meal into two piles, one for me and one for grandfather. Not exactly a banquet, is it? I asked Silas. Silas jumped on the table and lapped the water in my mug. Oh no, you don't, I said as I lifted Silas off the table. We still have rules, even if mother isn't here to enforce them. Cats eat on the floor. I poured a bit of water into what was left of a bowl for him. I tasted a green bean, tough as leather, but just not as tasty. <laughs> I suddenly remembered what I was missing. I pushed the bean to the side of my mouth and bowed my head. Thank you, Father, for keeping me alive. Please punish the terrible people who wrecked our home and stole our food. No, that's not right. They were probably hungry. Punish them a little bit for taking so much. They should have left something behind, and they had no reason to break everything. Deal with them as you see fit. Please take care of Mother and Eliza and Grandfather. I sat in silence for a moment. And Nathaniel. <laughs>